Greetings in the name of Christ. I'm Dr. Walter Meyer III at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The text we'll be going over is Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, and this is the Old Testament reading for proper 14. This is a great gospel text, a sedes for the chief doctrine. So, we will go over the Hebrew text, and also I will have various comments along the way. So, beginning with Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. So, we read there, after these things, that's a reference to what has happened previously in the preceding chapters in the story of Abram. And immediately preceding has been the story of Melchizedek coming out to greet Abram after his victory over the invading kings. After these things, now literally, was the word of Yahweh to Abram. His name is still Abram. It will be changed to Abraham in Genesis 17. Now, this is the typical Hebrew phrase for the word of Yahweh came to Abram. And how did it come then? We have that given to us specifically in the vision. So that follows next. And then saying. So there is the mark for what follows as a direct quotation. So this is what Yahweh says to Abram. Do not be afraid, Abram. So we recognize there the verb yare, and we also remember that when there is a negative command or a prohibition in Hebrew, it is lower all with the imperfect or jussive. Now, what would Abram be afraid of? In this context, we can say he was afraid of remaining childless. We'll come to that further. Do not be afraid, Abram. I, namely Yahweh, I am a shield for you or to you. So, magain is the word for shield, and then follows the preposition with the suffix. I am a shield for you or to you. That could also be rendered, I am your shield. Now, next comes the noun spelled this way. It's the seen, the kaf, and the resh, which means reward, and then it has the ka suffix on it, your reward. Then follows harbe. So that's from the verb rava, and this is the hyphial infinitive absolute. Uh, that combination with what follows at the end, ma'oth, meaning very, that combination could be translated either your very great reward or your reward shall be very great. Uh, that latter translation is the one that I favor. And going with that translation, what is this? This is the reward of being in a faith relationship with Yahweh, the covenant God. Not as if you know, we earn God's blessings. That's, of course, not the message. Rather, God in his grace and mercy and love loves to bless his people, his children, those who believe in him. Going on to verse 2. Abram said, Adonai Yahweh, so he's addressing, of course, the Lord, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give to me? So, titen there is from the verb nathan, what will you give to me? And I am going around, so the participle there, holek, and I am going around ariri. Now, that word means stripped, usually. But in this context, stripped has the nuance of childless, without a child. I'm going around stripped. Now, the next phrase, uven meshek. And that would also be paired with the following word, bethi. So that's all a construct chain. Now, meshek is an interesting word. Actually, it's a hapax, legomenon. And so the meaning, frankly, is uncertain, but judging from context, a very strong proposal is that meshek can mean acquisition. And so the whole phrase could be translated this way. 
and the son of acquisition of my house. And so again, uh, Meshach, that meaning conjectured from context, that combination could be smoothed out this way. The one who will acquire my house. And then going on to the last phrase in verse 2, he is, now that word Damasic means simply Damascus. That's the proper name for the great Syrian city. Uh, he is Damascus. We could uh, add something there. He is of Damascus. And then at the end, we have the man's name, his proper name, Eliezer. And so he is of Damascus, Eliezer, or Eliezer. And so to review that verse, because it's a little more complex, Abram said, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give to me? And I am going around childless, and the one who will possess my house or acquire my house, he is of Damascus, Eliezer. And here we have also the idea of servant adoption, which was a practice in the ancient Near East, and this has been uh, made known by archaeological finds. And so if a couple remained childless, they would adopt a servant or a slave in their household and make him their heir, and he would take care of them as they grew old, and when they died, then he would acquire their possessions. Going on to verse 3. By the way, there are various proposals for this complex verse 2. If you want to see more, you can look at Victor Hamilton in his Genesis commentary. Going on to verse 3. Abram said, Behold, to me you have not given seed. So that's straightforward enough. So Abram is speaking to Yahweh and he says, Behold, to me, Abram, you, Yahweh, have not given seed, descendant, descendants. And behold, so another uh, hine here, behold, the son of my house. So, ven bethi, the son of my house. And then we have this participle, yoresh. He is possessing me, or he will be possessing me. So, Yoresh is the call active participle, masculine singular. Yoresh means to possess. We also recall that with regard to participles, their tense is determined by the context. So, again, this could be either uh, he is possessing me or he will be possessing me. And that has the sense of he is my heir or he will be my heir. That preceding phrase, the son of my house, that's referring to one who's in my household, one who's in my camp uh, with me, and that's a reference back to Eleazar uh, at the end of verse 2. So he, the son of my house, he will be my heir. Going on to verse 4, behold, and behold, the word of Yahweh was to him, so it's the same idea as we had back in verse 1, came to him and then saying, there again is the marker as to what follows being direct discourse, uh, direct quotation, saying, this one will not possess you. So again, that verb, Yarash, uh, Zeth there is this one, referring back to Eliezer, but God is saying now, this one will not possess you, or this one will not be your heir. The next phrase, ki im, that can be seen as having the sense, but, but, asher, that which will, and then the verb, yatsa, yetse, so this is a call imperfect, third masculine singular, but that which will come out from your loins. There we have the word for loins, uh, the preceding portion at the very beginning is the preposition min and then the cas suffix at the end from your loins he and then again the verb yarash he will possess you or he will be your heir and so God is indicating here that Abram will have a natural child 
Once again, verse 4, Behold, the word of Yahweh was to him, saying, This one will not be your heir, but that which will come out from your loins, he will possess you or be your heir. Going on to verse 5. Here we have the verb yatsa. Now, this is actually a hifiel, uh, imperfect with the wow consecutive. It's the hifiel short form. There's no yod in between the tzadi and the aleph, and that's the short form because it's with the wow consecutive. And that has the sense to bring out. Uh, he brought him, otho was the object, he brought him outside. So Yahweh brought Abram outside. Uh, that's the next phrase, ha chutza. So chutz means outside. Uh, ha is actually the definite article. He brought him to the outside, literal translation. Uh, the a ah at the end is the locative he. So he brought him literally to the outside, wayomer, and he said. Now the verb habet. Uh, that's from the verb navat, and this is a hifiel imperative. Uh, the seire that we would expect there underneath the bait has been shortened to segol because of the makaif which follows. Words to the right of the makaif are deprived of their accent. So that brings on the shortening. That means look now, that particle that follows, na, uh, could be translated as na, perhaps it's a little, a bit of a softening particle. Look now to the heavens. So we recognize shamayim, the definite article, and also here again, the locative hey at the end. Look now to the heavens, and now an imperative, and count the stars, kokavim, if you are able, im to call, and the verb you call is a verb unto itself, and that's simply the call imperfect, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so that is Yahweh now speaking to Abram, Ko Yihya Zarekka, thus will be your seed. So God here, of course, is talking now about numerous descendants for Abram. Now, judging and from what Paul writes, especially in Romans 4 and Galatians 3. And Paul loved this passage, especially the next verse, verse 6. He loved to quote this. We can say that the seed God is referring to is Abram's spiritual seed. Again, based on Romans 4 and Galatians 3. But the point is this, in this context, in order to have spiritual seed, there had to be a savior. And in order for there to be a savior, Abram had to have a son and descendants. So this is how it all fits together. And then going on to verse six, and again, one of the key verses in all of scripture. And he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now the verb here, aman, uh, this is actually now the first occurrence of the verb believe in the Bible. And this is the hifiel of aman. We'll come back to that verb. The next verb is the verb kashav. That's the wow consecutive call imperfect. And it has the feminine suffix at the end, the third singular feminine suffix at the end, because it's an abstract concept, and feminines go with abstract concepts, and he reckoned it. What is the it? Abram's faith, his believing. So, and he, Abram, believed in Yahweh, and he, Yahweh, reckoned it, Abram's faith, to him, now, following simply is righteousness, but we can add the word as righteousness. Now, going back to that first word in verse 6, that verb aman, and we see again that this is not a wow consecutive imperfect. Rather, it's a simple conjunction with the perfect. Now, the commentator Lupul has this observation. This brings out the permanence of Abram's 
believing that is ongoing. This is being stressed. Not that Abraham believed just this one time, but he was constant in his faith. The verb aman carries the basic idea of firmness or certainty. And used in the hip field, it has the nuance of to be certain about something, to be assured. And this, again, can be translated with the following phrase, literally, uh, he believed in Yahweh, with that bait preposition. And the commentators Wenham and Kaiser make this observation, believing in someone means not only believing what he says, accepting his statements as true and trustworthy, but also having confidence in his character regarding the person as totally dependable. Now, with regard to a statement from Yahweh, what word or promise of Yahweh did Abram believe in? Well, here we can be inclusive in our understanding, taking into consideration previous portions of Genesis. And of course, we go first to Genesis 3.15. There is the first gospel, the promise of the coming Savior. We can also bring in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, because there God indicates that the coming promised Savior will be a descendant of Abram. There is the promise, in connection with you, Abram, all the clans of the earth will be blessed. There can be this universal blessing associated with Abram because of the coming Savior who will be his descendant. So the bottom line here is this, talking about Abram's believing, his faith. Abram believed in the Savior to come. He had faith in the future Christ. Abram believed in this main promise from God, and he believed in all the other promises of God. So once again, here is the chief doctrine. As brought out by Paul, going again to Romans chapter 4, Galatians 3. Justification by God's grace through faith in the Messiah. I'd like to close by reading an excerpt from Luther. This is in Luther's works. This is in volume 3, pages 22 through 23. So portions. Luther writes, Our virtues cannot help us before God's judgment, for they are polluted and contaminated by lust. Therefore, unless God averts his eyes from our sins, yes, even from our righteousness and virtues, and reckons us as righteous because of faith, which lays hold of his Son, we are done for. Mercy alone, or the accounting alone, saves us. Hence, our doctrine that we are justified before God solely through his accounting mercy has its foundation in this passage. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Luther goes on. This is the source from which Paul has drawn his discussions in Romans and Galatians, where he ascribes righteousness to faith, not to works or the law. And finally, from Luther. The chief and most important part of the doctrine is the promise. To it, faith attaches itself, or, to speak more clearly, faith lays hold of it. Moreover, the confident laying hold of the promise is called faith, and it justifies, not as our own work, but as the work of God. For the promise is a gift, a thought of God, by which he offers us something. It is not some work of ours when we do something for God or give him something. No, we receive something from him, and that's solely through his mercy. Therefore, he who believes God when he promises, he who is convinced that God is truthful and will carry out whatever he has promised, is righteous or is reckoned as righteous. Thus far, Luther. Again, what a great text. May God bless your meditation on it, your study of it, and your proclaiming of this gospel word. The Lord be with you.